Welcome to a brand new series with Maximum Guitar Works. This one is kind of unique. This series is actually not generally designed for the public, but it's designed for a class that I'm teaching at a public school in my local area that offers a luthier program. And I was asked to teach a basic electric guitar building class this year. So this video series is primarily for my students of that class, but I decided to make it available to everybody and hopefully other people out in YouTube world can get something out of this. But I will be dealing with the basic knowledge of electric guitar making, like you're building your very first guitar. So if you're on your 12th guitar, there may not be as much content for you in this video, but it's starting at ground level. Now also, I have some tools in my personal shop that the school does not have in their shop. So I will generally be using very basic techniques so that all my first time electric guitar builders can build it to the way I'm doing these videos with basically the tools that we have in the shop of the college. One of the requirements of this course that I'm making for these first time guitar builders is they have to build a Stratocaster or a Telecaster. If we can keep it focused to those two basic foundational guitars, I honestly believe that my students will get a better education working foundation up. And then those basic foundational principles can be used for advanced guitar design techniques in the future. And hopefully uh, they'll choose to participate in the next semester where I teach an advanced electric guitar building class and that will involve a lot more things like carved tops, set necks, uh, stainless steel frets, so on and so forth, maybe some advanced electronics uh, configurations and things like that. So that's the purpose of this video. So if you're into that, if that's going to help you, tune into the series, make sure you hit subscribe, hit the little uh, bell icon so that you get alerts when they come down. But uh, that's what we're going to do. All right, for my students, this is going to be a step-by-step -step program. And we're going to start at the beginning. We're starting with the neck, and that's what we're going to start with in class. I have included in your online materials basically a little note-taking worksheet, and it kind of goes over the steps that we're going to go in the order that they're going to that we're going to do them in. And it gives space for you to kind of draw diagrams, take notes, and things like that, so that you can repeat this process on your own in the future should you want to. So that's what we're going to base it on. And the first step of this is to mill the neck blank flat and square. So that's our first step that we're going to cover. Now before we get to that, let's talk about what I have in front of me. What we're doing in the class in order to save time, rather than designing a guitar from scratch and taking multiple weeks in order to kind of develop it, tweak it, and make templates and such like that, we're going to be providing the templates we have com multiple complete sets of templates for the Stratocaster and the Telecaster. There's variations you can certainly do to that if you choose, but, but that will require you kind of developing maybe your own template. So in this case, here's a traditional Telecaster template. And in this video series, we are going to build the Telecaster. And in class, what I'm going to do is build the Stratocaster. So what you'll see is your homework assignment will be to watch this video before the class that we work on that step and then come to class, bring your questions, do a little Q&A and then I'm going to do another demonstration in class building the Stratocaster and the slight variations between those two instruments. So what we're looking at here is the basic template. Now because I generally build only custom guitars and uh, I, I really don't build copies of strats and tellies as, as a normal protocol unless somebody would request it. I have my own headstock template and I've made another template with my headstock on it, but everything else is exactly Telecaster on here. And so I'm gonna use my Maximum Guitar Works uh, headstock shape on this, but everything else is exactly the same. We've also got templates for the fretboard itself and that kind of gives us uh, the ability to place markers. I've got alignment pin holes that's going to allow perfect placement on top of the neck when we're ready to glue those together. I've also got a side view which isn't always necessary but I think in our case and the way we're going to shape out 
the, uh, the top of the headstock here in the traditional fender manner, I think it'll be nice to be able to have that drawn and then connect some of the areas across the front so that we, we, we know where our stop points are, especially when we're taking this curve out and sanding that uh, down to spec. So we have that to use just in case uh, it becomes handy. And then for the fretboard itself, uh, we've got a template that's used on a table saw and with this template we can cut all the fret slots at 25.5 inch scale all the way up to 22 frets which is what we're going to use for the Stratocaster. Uh, Telecaster uh, traditionally has 21 frets. Now with that said, if you want to build a Telecaster body and more of a Stratocaster style neck to it, we can combine those techniques and we can talk about that in class on how to do that. So there's not an issue at all with that. Now in an introductory video that was private that went out to my class alone, I talked about wood sourcing, where to get it, what to use, how to save some money here and there and such like that. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to build this Telecaster guitar using basically raw materials that I purchased from my local hardwood store. So right now I have a 30 inch long piece of flat sawn maple, hard rock maple. Okay, and that is big enough for what I need for my neck blank. Most neck blanks that you're going to purchase for electric guitars are going to be one inch thick, they're going to be four inches wide, they're going to be 30 inches long, roughly. Now for the Telecaster, all we need is about 26 inches long, so we could get away with something less, and we could get away with something maybe three and a quarter to three and a half inches wide, so if, if you have a piece like that, you can make it work. I prefer the four inch because I know even with a full Stratocaster style headstock, I can take a four inch and I can lay my center line directly on the center line of the wood and I can have space for the headstock. The center line working is only easier because now if when I'm routing out the channels and such like that, I don't have to worry so much about lining it up for an offset router cut. I can line it up dead center and I can use a router table and I know whichever way I approach it from, left to right, you know, one way or the other way, center line is going to be center line. So that's why I prefer to work with a four inch piece. Uh, but again, you can get by with less than that, uh, certainly with a Telecaster. Okay, in conjunction with the Hard Rock Maple Neck on this particular Telecaster build, I am going to elect to use Indian Rosewood. It's just what I want to do. If you want to use a maple fretboard, if you want to use some exotic woods for your fretboard, that is perfectly fine and acceptable. The fretboard dimensions, uh, typically for an electric guitar, they're going to be somewhere around two and three quarters inches wide. I think you can get by with about two and a half. A little extra is good. It's going to be about 20 inches long, roughly, and, and that certainly gives you more than enough. And the thickness of the boards that you'll find if you buy a fretboard blank, which I highly encourage because this is wood that is pre-screened, you know, basically for the quality that needs to be for a fretboard, what you're going to find is somewhere between a quarter inches thick and five sixteenths of an inch thick. Anywhere in between there is fine. I prefer the 5 sixteenths and I source my materials from companies that provide that because it gives me room for error. It gives me a little extra cushion when I'm doing my radiusing so I don't get the edges of the board too thin and then I don't have appropriate room for the side dot markers and other things like that. So I prefer that even though ultimately this is going to be a little thinner than 5 16 It's probably going to be close to about 7 millimeters. You'll hear me jumping back and forth between the metric system and you know the standard um, inches base system and that's because you have to be able to jump back and forth between both for various reasons. So so that's what's going to happen with this fretboard. So the first step that we are going to do is we are going to square and thickness this piece of board to be exactly what I want it to be.
So everybody should be proficient with squaring up a board. So now that those steps are done, we have got a board that is flat on one side, parallel on the other, and then we've got square on either side. I've got a four inch board that's about 30 inches long, more than I need, but this is about a standard. And I thicknessed this board down to just below three quarters of inches. Why did I take it down to a little less than three quarters of an inch, as you ask? Well, that is a good question. So what I, why I did that is you have to take into consideration your fretboard. Now we talked about I prefer a 5 16 inch fretboard and ultimately I'll kind of come down to about 7 millimeters on this guy once I do the radiusing. The overall thickness that we want on our headstock is 1 inch overall thickness. Once it's all, everything is all said and done, the neck and the fretboard at the, at the center line where, where's the highest point of it, you want to be about 1 inch. I took the neck maple down to just under and then the thickness of this equals about a half of millimeter thicker than one inch or 25.4 millimeters. All right, so that's why I took it down ever so slightly and that's where we are. Once we get to this stage, I want to establish center lines on this board and try to figure out the layout of the template itself. So what I'm going to determine is number one, what is going to be the top and what is going to be the back. I'm looking for imperfections. I've got a minor imperfection of this piece of maple that I picked up at the local hardwood store up here. So I know that I can work with that because I've got the extra room. I can slide back this way or I can just make sure my headstock is on this end so where the headstock slopes off the, perfect, the imperfection will be cut out. So that's all we want to do. So this is going to be my top. So I wrote top on there so I don't get confused later. And just for perspective I want to determine where I want my nut line to be. Now I have a little bit of snipe on the back end here from the planer so I'll stay clear of that so I think about this position will look good. My nut will end up being right about here. I've got plenty of room to flex so I'm not getting super critical and now I will take the side profile template just so that I keep my orientation correctly and know what ultimately I'm going to do. The back of the headstock will be flush with the back of this material. There will be no material removed there. You can clamp it in place if you need, but this, this is not anything I'm cutting to, so it's not going to be super critical, but I want to know approximately where my lines are going to be. All right, so now once we get that on there, I'm going to establish the center line of this board. One tool you can use is a center finding rule and that basically just allows you to look and get the same number on either side. I know this is a four inch board so if I line up the two inch mark on both sides which is perfectly lined up and I go to the center with a sharp ruler or a mechanical pencil I've got that perfectly annotated and I'll come back and I'll do the other side. A nice long precision ground straight edge will then connect those dots and that will become my reference for drawing my template on here. I've got the template drawn. I didn't bother with the fret markers because obviously they're going to go in the fretboard itself. Okay, one thing that we're going to have to decide with our neck is what style of truss rod do we want to use. Now these are three from Stu Mac called Hot Rod Series truss rods, but you'll see three different ones. Uh, the first one on the left has kind of a, like an Allen adjustment, and that typically would come out through the headstock area uh, for adjustment purposes. The second one is a slotted truss rod, and that is typically installed so it comes out the heel of the neck, and the spoke wheel adjustment uh, technique is also in the heel side. I think what we'll do for this one is the center one, the slotted, and then for the one we do in class, I'll probably use either the spoke wheel or maybe, maybe the Allen, but we'll do a different one so that you can see multiple styles for those of you who are attending my class. All right, before we go on to the next step, I want to show you a close-up of what I did for marking the top of the fretboard blank. I not only drew the profile around there, but I also uh, took some time to map out the center line, to map out where 
Uh, I'm going to be using carbon fiber re reinforcement rods, so where they're going to go, uh, the truss rod would go in the center, and I've got markers on either side for where they start and stop. So when looking at this close, you can see I've got the top marked, there's the headstock, and you'll see different markings here. So I've got a transition end line. That first line is actually where my curve, my one inch radius curve from the headstock uh, to the fretboard area is going to be. And then we have two lines for the start and stop of the nut slot. And then you'll see the carbon fiber rods and the truss rod will stop at that location and they all three of those will travel down all the way to the end. The carbon fiber stops about a half inch away. Since we're going to be using the slotted truss rod, it requires that this have a round hole in the end of the heel and this slides into that and then drops into place. My preference is to drill the hole first. Once I get the hole to the appropriate depth, which is a half an inch in this case, then I can go and I can set stops on my router table and only, only route out the slots from that line I had here to this line I had there, and then it's going to slide in and be a perfect fit. The first thing that we're going to have to do in order to drill that hole is to get the end of the heel line flush cut. And we're going to cut that perfectly flush so that when we drill the hole, we got the exact depth from that point, because that'll be the critical point of measurement. All right, so I just cut perfectly square right on the edge of my template line that I drew. And so that is going to be the point that I need to drill the hole for the end of the slotted adjustment. Now, how do we drill that hole? Well, certainly, any of you highly talented folks out there can take a hand drill and kind of line that up and drill it straight in close enough where a little wiggle room or whatever this will work. But you know, let's think about it for a second. If we're going to drill a hole, why don't we try to make it perfectly straight and perfectly centered? And to do that, what do we need? Well, we need one of my favorite things in the whole wide world, a jig. All right, jigs are cool. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. And this jig I just made uh, for this specific purpose with this exact truss rod. So it's a very unique piece just for this one application, but if I were to make a whole bunch of these, now I have a way to make it precision. Let me show you what I did here. I took some 3 quarter inch Baltic birch. I drew center lines around the whole thing so I know what center is and then I inserted a 3 8 inch bushing, a drill bushing, which is 5 8 inch on the outside. You can see on the inside it gets you know, pretty close um, to the edge. The dimensions that I needed for this placement was the thickness of the Baltic birch and then center line 7 16 of an inch down. That is the specs that this particular truss rod calls for. So I measured um, maybe twice, maybe four times, I'm not sure. But anyway, we, we drilled that, we set the bushing in there, we glued and screwed this piece together. Now what this gives us is a way where I can line up all the center lines together, perfectly square piece, and clamp this down, and then I can use that drill bushing to drill that hole. All right, now we've got this clamped down. I just used a flat table for stability, a couple cam clamps to hold that in place. This one is also holding in the perfectly lined up jig that I made for this, lined up on the end. Now the key thing is the top of the neck is facing up. The 7 16 I need is from the top, not from the bottom. That would be a really bad mistake. You don't want to do that. And now at this point with the stop collar in place, I can just run that in and slowly bore that hole. Now, chips aren't going to eject as well with the stop collar and through that bushing because there's a gap behind there. So I'm going to push in, pull out in order to kind of get some of those chips to eject so that it drills a little bit better. Right. <clears throat> 
the last thing we need to do before we take this to the router to route our truss rod and carbon fiber channels is to make space since we're not cutting all the way through and this is just going to stick out the end we need a hole here that that can drop through and then begin to slide in so really I'm going to need about that much room to drop in so that's about a half an inch so I'm going to make a half inch hole with a half inch Forstner bit so that this guy can drop in and then as it starts working through the hole has enough to drop down into the slot and then slide back into position. And that should do it. Once I get my truss rod slot in there, that should just drop right, right down where it needs to be. So it's looking pretty good. Now we're ready to cut the truss rod and the carbon fiber support channels. And what I've got here is a jig. Now I made this jig as an enhancement to a wooden jig that I had previously made that was out of poplar. Had limited adjustability and it had to be clamped down to the table. This jig I'd made out of 80-20 aluminum with support brackets that are adjustable, end stops that I can actually add to it, and toggle clamps underneath that kind of secure it to the table in the proper place. I did a separate video on that. You might want to check that one out. But the point is, is I've got this bit perfectly centered between these two rails, and I'm going to take this and turn it upside down, and I'm going to line it up with... A line for my stop point, a line for my other end point, and I'm going to route this all the way across to that stop point and slowly, in maybe three passes, get my truss rod channel perfectly there. The advantage of the dual rail system as opposed to a single rail fence system is there's just it's a no-brainer. You don't have to worry about that piece of wood kind of grabbing if you feed it the wrong direction or what have you and it kind of pulls in and it kind of messes up your truss rod uh, or anything like that. All right, we clean all the wood chips out of there. And now we take the truss rod with the slotted head part down and we will slide that right in. It's gonna be a tight fit. We gotta get it in there. We'll just give it a, a little bit of tapping. So it clears that slot, presses straight down, front and back. You should have clearance where it should be perfectly flush and smooth. And, and there we have it. 
Ultimately, we're going to use a couple drops of silicone glue underneath these brass blocks to kind of hold them in place. Uh, so that'll be nice. And then the, the back will be adjusted so it's perfectly flush with the end of the uh, heel. And that will be that. So now we're going to switch over and do the carbon fiber channels. Now we are going to do some test cuts. It's always good to have a block of extra wood lying around that's the exact same width as your neck and you can do test cuts to make sure that you have the right placement and the right depth and that's what we're going to do and then make our cuts. The cool thing about this jig is I've got hold down clamps on either side of this table and once I get that set I can simply shift this fore and aft until I get that placement right where I need it to be and then I'll lock down these clamps. I'm not 100% sure if this apparatus is going to work on any router table that the school has, but I'll bring it in when we get to this phase of, of our construction in class. And <clears throat> if it works, you're welcome to use it. Uh, if you want to just use one fence, you're welcome to do that too. Now, if you're using the carbon fiber support rods, which isn't required, but I like to make that neck as stiff as I possibly can. So I'm going to slide one end in like this, and I'm going to mark where I want to make that cut. It's hard to see a pencil line, so you could either take one of those kind of silvery uh, pencils so that you can see it. Or I just like to take a contrasting piece of tape and put it right at the edge and I'll cut it right there. Now, when you go to cut this, for folks that are cutting this at school and you think it'd be just as easy to go on the table saw, don't do it. Carbon fiber on those saw stop table saws that the school has is conductive and therefore you will blow that squib faster than, I don't know, faster than something, but really fast. So don't do that. And in fact, if you go to use a chop saw or any other type of carbide tooth blade, the carbon fiber will begin to dull that blade more so than cutting through wood. So it's not really worth it for such a small piece. What I'm gonna do is just take a little tiny kind of jeweler saw, little inlay style saw with a fine tooth jeweler's blade in there and I'm going to cut through it in no time whatsoever and it'll be plenty smooth enough uh, for going inside of the neck so no issues. Mmm, don't you love the smell of cutting resin? Kind of reminds me of a uh, skateboard I had in the 70s. What I haven't figured out is what to do with all these extra short pieces. If you have an idea, let me know. So these will just slide in and drop down. And once we take the old epoxy and glue those babies in there, this just became a stiffer neck. That's simple, well worth the effort. And then obviously the truss rod for the adjustability of the neck. I'm gonna epoxy these carbon rods into place now and I'm gonna let it cure properly. In the next class video, 
we're going to continue the process of this fender style neck. So remember, until that next video, anything you do, start with excellence.